30 podcast. How are you? How's everyone doing? Welcome to the show. It's Linz and Krista. Let's take a deep breath. Mm. <sighs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I, I didn't. Mm. Justin mm. always is like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> He's like, why do you like the sounds? I guess because I, when I'm listening to people, I'm like, mm, yes. Mm. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just kind of like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. I, I think it's a woman thing. I don't know if it's a girl I feel like thing. we're known for that sometimes. People I'm are like, listening. Mm-hmm. I'm literally absorbing it in my fucking blood. So I'm just, and he's like, God. And then Crystal's little baby Zen, we were walking on the street and I was, she was telling me some truth. And I was like, mm. And he's like, mm, 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 <laughs> making fun of me. <laughs> you know who else does it? Rachel Rosen. Do you know, remember Rachel oh, Rosen? yeah. We did a beautiful workshop with her in Austin. And then there's also an episode on um, her work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she is the daughter of two therapists. And she said that that's why she does it. Cause it's like kind of like a, I think I I vibe when people do that same. It's so a, if you're listening yes. to me and I'm telling you something like intimate or personal and you're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I'm like, Oh, she's with same, me. Same. She's with me. And you feel comfortable. You're like, I'm going to really <laughs> let it go. And you're like, and then I fucking did this. And they're like, Whoa. <laughs> and people get scared. Same. I like that To That's important for me. Cause I can tell when people are not paying attention. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, mm-hmm. and then I don't share. I'm like, oh, well, this is pointless. Yes. Or the, you feel like they don't know what to do with the information. And you're like, oh, unsafe. Yes. Unsafe. Take it, I take it back. Immediately. <laughs> like if they, if they have a, a kid or like an animal and it walks in and they look at it, I'm like, oh, man. I think with men, and this is a generalization, but even like if I'm talking to Sean about something, he'll be silent the whole time that I'm speaking, which is actually respectful yes. and whatever. But... And then he'll like pause after I'm done and there will be a a long pause. And then I'll be like, do you want me to like, do you want me to just listen or do you want me to respond? And I'm like, I needed some. mm -hmm I would spiral. Yeah, I need some. mm -hmm Because I'm like when he's talking, I'm like, "Uh mm uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. mm -hmm." (laughs) Yes. I would honestly spiral. Yeah. Justin (laughs) looks at me like he's like blank. I'm like, like. I'm s- I mean, it's completely blank. <laughs> so let us know, you guys, if do we like that? Do we do that? I think, well, actually being on the podcast, having a podcast has helped me to not do that as much as I used to. Because on the show, we I mean, at the beginning, the first year episodes, we were like, mm, mm, yeah, mm, <laughs> totally. Like, uh. Yeah. We and we've had to, to so muzzle much. myself. Because I think at points it might have been even distracting to the guest. Yes. Not th- we didn't know it in the moment. But I can imagine that, like, if we're mm-hmming in unison and chorus and just creating a symphony on the other side while they're trying to bear their soul, it's distracting. It was very distracting. <laughs> so if you guys want some inspo, go to the earlier episodes. Um, oh, man. Also, I'm playing around. You guys, so I had my hormones tested yes. a few months ago. So I've had a, been on a hormone journey for a few years now. I had um, actually did a few episodes on it. So if you guys are interested in hormone health, I did a full episode on um, how I healed my hormones naturally. It took like a year, but I got tested when I moved to LA. They were really off. And then I got retested recently because I was just kind of feeling like I needed it. I also wanted to test my thyroid. And so I've been taking testosterone <laughs> because I had low testosterone. And I swear to God, my voice is getting lower. I don't know if I'm like, <laughs> I think so. I think so a little bit. Yeah. I'm like sitting in the it's car. Subtle, but I'm nice. a baritone. <laughs> I honestly, I'm testing out my new singing voice. <laughs> I am. Let's get it on. Uh, yes, I am <laughs> singing the craziest things in the low. Like I keep trying to go high and then I'll go low. And I'm like, is it the testosterone? I'm like, what is. Wow. Isn't that interesting? So what does testosterone do? So in testosterone. This balancing? It, having a healthy. So a woman having a healthy testosterone level is really important for muscle mass, mm-hmm. really important for like a good muscle to fat ratio, really important for um, like a healthy symbiotic relationship between all the hormones. And it actually can make people happy. So they have shown a lot of studies that when women have low testosterone, they're more likely to feel depressed or anxious. So it could actually be a really good like mood stabilizer Mm. as a hormone. And so it's so interesting because I've been looking for a lot of research on it because I've been, I'm literally supplementing the least amount ever. It's, it's so insignificant and it's a cream, but I've been looking for more information on it. I'm like, Oh, women's uh, hormone replacement and stuff like that. There's nothing. There's only for men because people just assume they're like, Oh, estrogen is the female hormone. Testosterone is the male hormone, but it's actually really under, um, 
under researched or undershared about how mm-hmm. important it is for women because it's like helps you get out of bed early. It, it just that's actually more cortisol, but it just helps you to like feel more energized through the day. Yeah. And yeah, it's fascinating. Wow. So when I, cause I've noticed that when I weight lift more, yes. my mood is better. Yes. Cause it, that helps your testosterone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's if huge. I'm doing like, you know, intense cardio all the time, I'm actually more depleted, more like yes. blah. But the weight lifting, there's something, and I never knew that. I was thinking about that too with you, with your transition from Soul Cycle doing, you know, 13 classes a week of cardio mm-hmm. to weightlifting. And it's so interesting because it's like it does deplete your testosterone in a way because your adrenal and your cortisol is kind of yes. skyrocketing in the morning normally as a natural rhythm in your body, but then you're also really amplifying that with your cardio. Uh-huh. And so when you're not doing cardio straight in the morning and you are weightlifting, it really helps build your testosterone naturally, which is really important. And that's actually what helps build your lean muscle mass mm-hmm. and helps reduce your body fat with a healthy testosterone level. So it's interesting to think about that. Like as we think about the way that we work out and how hard you work out, when you do cardio I mean I love I love all forms of working out but how important it is to like incorporate the weightlifting and really think about how you can support a healthy like female testosterone but then you know for people that have PCOS which we've talked about before on the podcast you have to be mindful because yes. that's like an imbalance of your testosterone so it's really an interesting dance that we do and an interesting balance but I'm thinking about all the factors that affect your hormones yes and how people don't no. Yeah. So there's so many that could be, you know, obviously increasing or decreasing, whether it's testosterone or estrogen, and we're not fully aware of what that is. And mm-hmm. so it could get to a point where it is so out of control mm-hmm. where it just, I'm sure, is just so overwhelming and frustrating. But yeah, you're right. I think there needs to be more research or and or just literature on the lack of testosterone or the lower levels of Mm -hmm. in women. I went to Dr. Shirley. She's in Beverly Hills. She's Mm -hmm. like a natural hormone specialist. Lauren Everett's uh, Bostic recommended her and really loved her after she had Zaza. So she's been a great reference and she's really educational and it's all bioidenticals, which has been helpful. But um, yeah, the whole thing is just so, it's so crazy. All right, let's track your voice, baby. Yeah, you guys, this is the beginning of us tracking my voice. (laughs) We'll see if it continues to drop. Maybe I'll have to stop at some point. (laughs) Once we get so low, we'll be like, okay, wow. Well, it's also just like, um, yeah, I think our voice is such a tell, and we've talked about that on the pod. So it's like, yes, there is definitely like a uh, physical aspect of what's happening. But then also maybe just like, I don't know. Maybe it has to do with like speaking your truth more, just being yeah. more, you know, I don't know. Care, I don't know. It is. It is something about caring less. It's mm-hmm. like, or being, and this is what I've been focusing on this year is being less performative. Yes. In, and it b- being performative, I mean that in subtle ways. So it's like when I meet someone being so uber. <laughs> Dude, when do you do this? Oh my God. Um. Just be, you know, when you meet someone or you're talking with someone and (laughs) you're just like killing yourself to really support them in whatever they're saying or, you know, even when I'm out at events or even with, not at events anymore, but with people, I'll have to bring my energy back to me because sometimes even last night I was noticing, I'm like, oh, bring your energy back because you're kind of reaching at people looking for... I don't know if I was looking for people to feed me energetically because I was tired, but I just felt myself reaching. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, be less performative. Like, just be, mm-hmm. just be. You can be it's quiet. almost like when you're tired, you overcompensate yes. so yes. that people don't know that you're tired mm-hmm. and that you want to go home and go to sleep. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I feel that. I feel that. Interesting. I'm excited for this episode. So Same. from an almost 30 perspective, just a few notes. So Podcast Pro, if you guys want to launch, grow, or monetize a pod, you can go to almost30.com. There's tons more information there. And the website was launched in January. So it's beautiful. It's this beautiful labyrinth of us. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's just a beautiful labyrinth. <laughs> uh, membership enrollment is going to reopen mm-hmm. uh, in end of July. So we'll start that new enrollment August 1st. So make sure you're signed up for the waiting list. We have a couple hundred on the waiting list right now. You can go to almost30.com and sign up for the waiting list so you can stay in touch with everything there and then what else what else um they sale oh yeah 
So we have Earth Day coming up in April. And as you guys know, and if you don't know, we have a beautiful, sustainable, eco-friendly line of almost 30 merch uh, that we designed with Danny of Daisy LA. She's an incredible female entrepreneur here in LA. And so it's locally made, really fun, unique, like one of a kind designs. Um, And we have sweatshirts and t-shirts and they're going to be 50% off. Mm-hmm. Uh, so stay tuned for that sale. It's happening next week. Just make sure you follow us on Instagram at almost 30 podcast and uh, you'll be up to date. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to kind of give you guys some of that slow fashion mm-hmm. women owned apparel at 50% off. And then congrats to all the winners of the community appreciation week on Instagram that we did. We did a bunch of giveaways on our Almost 30 podcast Instagram, which was a joy and a delight. We've been giving away books in the membership. We had like 100 books that we gave mm-hmm. away. So we've been working hard. Given season. It's given season. It's Just nice. working hard to make sure you guys know how appreciated you are by us. Truly, truly. All right, on today's show, so, so excited to welcome back Lovey Ajayi Jones. Oh, man. Come she on. is such a delight and so fun. And her message about speaking truth and about really being a troublemaker in the best sense, I feel like is so relevant for now. Um, It's so important that we shake things up in society and as a culture and that we really stand up for what we believe in. And she is just such a great interview. So I'm excited for you guys to feel inspired by her, to laugh, to really just get into this conversation with someone that we really respect. We had her on the podcast maybe four years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's great to have her back on. Yeah. It was really cool just to understand this sense of troublemaker Mm -hmm. as something that lives in all of us, but she really talks about um, kind of how this troublemaker is, you know, put in its place from a very early age, whether it's through um, family norms, societal norms, etc., and just how we can reawaken this part of us, because especially this time on earth, it's so important um, that we are not giving in to our own personal fear about just speaking what's true for us and also... Um, what is true for the greater good. So it's really inspiring. It's really funny. She's just, I don't even know. She's one of a kind. She's one of a kind. That's the truth. Uh, Her new book, Professional Troublemaker, The Fear Fighter Manual, is out now. You can order it on her website, lovey.org, L-U-V-V-I-E.org, or anywhere books are sold. Yeah, it's such a good one, and we read it as well, and it's cool to hear her like voice in it. You very much feel like you're talking to her. It's very much written by her there's beautiful antidotes and it was so inspiring just to rethink the way um, or the relationship we have with fear it mm-hmm. was helpful it's tactical and we go through a lot of that today so I am really excited for this interview you guys are going to love it if you do make sure to share with a friend that you feel like needs a little inspiration needs a little kick in the booty that you feel like you want to be a professional troublemaker with or see as a professional troublemaker and just share the love yeah make sure you subscribe to almost 30 anywhere you listen to podcasts we have episodes every Tuesday and Thursday uh, stay tuned for this Thursday's episode we have a special special announcement um and we just really appreciate you thank you so much for being a part of almost 30 nation again go to almost 30.com lots of resources there for you make sure you follow us on instagram almost 30 podcast i'm at Lindsay simsick and i'm at it's krista thanks for listening y'all we'll, we'll see you on the other side we're excited awesome. to have you we're excited to talk it's like it's been a while honestly so you were on almost 30 like two or three years ago um, wow. when you had your first it's been book. that long. Yes, when you had your first yeah. book, which was incredible. So we're so excited to have That's you actually back. four and a half years ago then. Wow. No. No, it couldn't have been. My, my first book came out four and a half years ago. Maybe oh. we were, maybe you that came wild? on a, like a year after. It I had to know, have been a year after <laughs> because honestly, if you came on four and a half years ago, you would, wouldn't be here today coming back on. You'd be like. We were still baby nascent stages yes, of. Uh, yes. <laughs> Not professional at all. Doing this thing. Um, But huge congrats. We're excited to have you. I think the book is incredible. And I just, it felt, I heard you speak about the book and you were talking about how this was almost like the book that you resisted to write because it almost felt like it was too easy because it's really that, it felt like it was just so you. And sometimes it is the easiest, most aligned things really come through. And, and being number three on New York Times bestseller today is just proof of that. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, that process of, of writing this book and feeling like it was almost too clear for you and almost resisting that? Yeah, I, th I think that's like another form of self-sabotage, you know, when we all, we would doubt things that feels too obvious. Yes. You know, we will say, ah, that can't be it. Ah, that's too easy. Mm. And I think with this book, my clarity in it wasn't that it was too easy. It was just like, oh, duh, this whole time, this was sitting in front of my face and I wasn't uh, honoring it in the way I should. Again, I don't know why I always think I got to struggle with something. So, because when it was time to write book two, the whole time I should have looked at my TED talk as the inspiration for this book. But I remember being like, I don't know what it is. Maybe that's it, but what part of it? But the whole thing, the whole point of it, which was that like, when I insist on not using fear to make my decisions, I, I win. Like whenever I'm afraid and I do that thing anyway, I win. That's ultimately the goal of this book is to tell people that our fears are valid, but they shouldn't be what stops us from doing what we are purpose to do. The things that feel real to us, the things that sit on our shoulders and don't leave us until we get it done. So yeah, I keep learning the thing that feels too easy is probably the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that feeling of um, needing the struggle in order to feel like you've earned something is something that I relate to a lot. What, where do you think, is that just us as women or where do you think that comes from specifically from your, from your life? I think it's because it's almost like it's almost a trauma response because you're like, I have to work for every single thing. And maybe it's a woman thing. Maybe it's a black woman thing, but I just, and even, even those of us who are bold in this world, we still have this hang up that allows us to think that we have to constantly be toiling to get something. And I, and when people talk about imposter syndrome, I'm like, that's a, a different type of imposter syndrome. Like imposter syndrome doesn't always go away. It just shape shifts. So it looks different for everybody else. So I'm like, my versions of my version of imposter syndrome is not necessarily that I can't do it. My version is usually mm, that's too easy. That's not it. Or you're not ready for it yet. Like maybe wait a bit. That's my version of imposter syndrome. And um, I think all of us have it in some way where we will question it unless we feel like we have earned it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's part of like our culture, too. You know, it's almost like capitalism as well. It's like you have to earn yes. it, you have to work for it, you have to, you know, really grind for it. And it's, I've been thinking about this a lot lately and I was on a walk with a friend last night talking about that belief where we have to go through hell to get through heaven. Like you have to grind yes. and just give up and it and it has to be miserable. And it's, it's really almost something too that really rubs up against feeling worthy, but then also part of our experience where we feel like if I'm not explaining something where I'm like, oh, this is really good for me. This happened. I have to explain that it was really hard or that is miserable. If someone's ever like, you guys look like you're doing so good. I'm like, did you know that this happened to us and it has to be shitty? Because I have to like qualify the good things that happened to me almost. Um, but when you're talking about imposter syndrome in the book, it was really cool because you were talking about how it's the cousin of fear and how it's really like adjacent to fear when you're mm -hmm. feeling that imposter syndrome. Um, when you're explaining your imposter syndrome experience compared to others, like, do you tell people to qualify their own imposter syndrome as it looks like for them? Or do you really think that imposter syndrome is something that we all struggle with and the steps to remedy it are all the same? I don't think the steps remedy it is all the same. And I do think we all struggle with it. I just think that we, we are so hard on ourselves for having it when I'm just like, no, that's just kind of the norm as we're walking through this fearful world. Some of the things that we, we will have as our fears are even the fear of failure, which is often attached to the imposter syndrome, fear of success, because what if it does actually does go well, fear of rejection, you know, fear of falling flat on our face they're all tied together in how they operate in our day-to-day -day lives. But again, because it shape shifts, because imposter syndrome looks different and presents itself different for everybody, there's no one-stop shop thing that you can do that will 
fix everybody's version of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's why we have to do continuous work to figure out in those moments when we're questioning ourselves heavily, we should really figure out what we are actually afraid of. Name the fear. When you name the fear, then you can go, okay, if my fear of rejection, if my fear is like fear of rejection, okay, so if I get rejected, what actually happens? Like, what is the harm that I will face from that rejection? Is it made up harm that I'm coming up with in my head? Is it real consequences that will actually affect my standard of living, right? Like, I think we will take the fear and build it into this big dragon. We create the dragon. We should slay it, right? So whatever that fear is, I'm a fan of quantifying everything. So I, I always have a pen and paper with me. Like, I have pen and papers all over the place in my house, on my desk. Because I'm always like, I want to put it on paper to process it. Putting it on paper also kind of flattens it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. take some of the edge out of it. So once you name the fear, write it down. Okay, so I am afraid of rejection. All right. So if that fear does happen, if that worst case scenario, this apocalypse, this dragon does happen, what actually happens to you? Okay, if they reject me, I'm going to feel bad. Okay, so what else happens after that? And you're just like, no, I'm just going to feel really bad. So it becomes, so how big really is the thing that you're afraid of? How disastrous will it be to your life? How many times have you felt bad? Did you get over it? Were you able to wake up the next day? You know, these are fears that we should compare to the real reason why fear exists, to keep us from physical danger. Putting our hands in fire, jumping out of a plane without freaking parachute, leaving the house without a mask, okay, if you have sense in COVID. That same thing is the reason why we would be like, ah, I don't want to ask for that promotion or ah, I can't ask for the raise because I'm afraid that they're going to say no. Okay, if they say no, do you die? Right? Like, it's, it's like from the hangover, did you die? Mm-hmm. So I just think kind of giving ourselves the perspective of I might still feel the imposter syndrome. I might still have the fear of rejection. But it becomes less scary when you can put it in black and white. You said before just about, you know, anytime that you felt fear, it's really been something that's like propelled you forward. And I'm curious, like just in the context of this, like just thinking about how people are, are they just afraid of their potential? Because I've, I've experienced that for sure, where if I actually confront this fear, then that means that I have the potential to grow through it and become kind of that next next level version of myself, which would mean I would have to show up in a more embodied way or confident way. And it just requires more of us. Have you had experience with that or like any observations of that? Yeah, like my TED talk, I said no to that thing twice. Because my fear was I was going to get on the stage and bomb. I was afraid and my excuses, which were valid, okay, on the surface, since I was asked to do it in a year where I had like 50 speaking engagements and Ted, this was 2017 and Ted does not play about their speeches. Like they don't play about the fact that if you're going to be on their stage, they do quality control. And for them, that looks like getting you a coach. It looks like having you rehearse your talk a thousand times. It looks like they've actually reviewed the script to make sure that the talk is to the level that they can. So I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't have time for that. That's like basically a part-time job. And if I don't have time for that, that means I will get on that stage and I'll probably bomb. So I said no. I said no again a few months later. Um, when they asked me to come do a panel at TED, and I was like, oh, I really can't come at that point because I was emceeing and keynoting another conference. And then three weeks before, I realized that I actually didn't have to be at the conference I was emceeing until like the day after the first day of TED. So I hit him up just to be like, hey, can I get a day pass? So I can come cheer on my friends. And Pat Mitchell was like, well, if, if you can come to TED, we want you to speak. And I was like, what? And listen, all of my red flags were going off. Like, I remember even asking a friend, actually a group of friends, like, hey, should I go? To, should I do this thing? It's three weeks away. And the, that group of friends said, yeah, that's kind of tight. That's, that's you cutting it close. That I don't know if that one. Maybe you should wait till next year. And I was like, yeah, right. 
You're like, thanks. And I called my friend. <laughs> Moving on. I was like, perfect. <laughs> and I and I like created, I created this freaking uh, email. It's like three paragraphs of me being like, hey, I really wish I could come, but I don't want to take advantage of this. No, I said I want to take real advantage of this, and I I don't want to bomb on the stage. So let me just think about me for next year's. And I was about to send that when I called one of my friends, Unique Jones Gibson. And I was like, Unique, so they want me to do this TED Talk in three weeks. I'm about to turn it down. I've already written the email because everybody else has already had a coach. Everybody else has already had practice around this thing. So yeah, I'm probably gonna turn it down. And Unique said to me, everybody's not you. She was like, you've been on the stage every three days. You've been got, you've had your practice for the last nine years as a speaker. Everybody's not you. So I need you to get off my phone and go write this talk. And she hung up on me. And I deleted the email because I felt convicted. I was like, well, I guess I got to write this talk. And I was petrified. I was like, oh, my God. So in three weeks, but I was still on the road. I was still traveling like every three days, doing a speaking engagement at different places. I was like, so somehow in the next three weeks, I got to write a talk memorize this new talk and get on this grand stage and not bomb. Yikes. But I did just that. I did just that. I ended up writing the script in an Uber like two days after that, thinking that they would get the script and say, you're right. You weren't right for this. We'll think about you for next year. And I was very much prepared for that. So I sent the script off. Two hours later, I get an email from them. We love it. I was like, what? Madness. How? Um, but then, yeah, I got on that stage, on the TED stage, and I gave the talk like I'd done it a thousand times. It was like an out-of-body experience because I had just memorized it like three hours before I got on the stage. I wasn't even sure if I had it memorized. I was just praying for the best. And it flowed out effortlessly. The TED Talk you all saw is the TED Talk I gave. There was no editing magic. I didn't stop at one point and say, oh, what am I going to say next? It just flowed off my, out of my body. And that talk ended up being the first one from that event being featured on TED.com a month later. One million views the first month, and now it has 5.7 million. And I think about how that moment was so defining for me, so transformative. And I almost didn't do it twice. I almost didn't do it. Had that friend, Unique, not said, get off my phone and go write this talk, I wouldn't have done it. I would have been still in my fear. I would have still said no from the fear of bombing. When I don't bomb talks, I don't bomb. You know, back to putting that fear on paper, when you put the thing you're afraid of on paper. Also put the best case scenario on paper and then try to figure out which one is most likely. Is it the apocalypse that's most likely or this best case scenario? So I had never bombed a talk before. So why would that stage be where I finally go bomb? How, right? I could have, I should have run myself through that. Like how many times Okay, maybe you just give a talk that's your story. Do you know your story very well? You do, okay. Which Is that actually likely? So if for me, even what I said in the talk was a conviction of myself, where I talked about we let fear stop us from doing what we're purposed to do. I was talking about myself. And it related to so many people. I've gotten thousands of messages over the years. I still do today. I still get at least an email every day from somebody who says, like, I watched your TED Talk and here's what it did for me. And I thought about like, how often do we, have we let those moments pass us by, those transformative moments in our lives? How often have we actually said no to yes opportunities, you know, no to growth opportunities or no to that thing that could really transform your life in a real way, not just in the abstract way, because that talk has also gotten me countless speaking engagements. So that's why I was like, yeah, we got to talk about this because it was an intentional decision that I made to say yes. So fighting fear and, and knowing what we are afraid of is not a matter of like, it accidentally happens. <laughs> you don't just accidentally do something scary unless you don't know you were doing that thing. 
it's usually decisions that we make when we say, yeah, I was afraid, but I still did it anyway. So I'm just like, I want to, I want to loan people courage in the way that my friend Unique did. I want my book to loan people power in those moments when they're about to say no to that yes opportunity because they didn't think they're good enough or ready for it, or don't know if they've earned it or it feels too easy. I want my presence and my voice and my work to be the thing that tells you, get off my phone and go write this talk over and over again in whatever situation, go have that tough conversation, go ask for the raise, go ask for the promotion, whatever the thing is that is that we're so afraid of. I, I want this book to do that. Yeah, it's your voice is so clear and it. it's like cool. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. this is like <laughs> reading specifically from you. And when you were talking in that story, it's so interesting, you know, the difference between sort of like the friend groups. And it's like, so you have the one set of friends that are like, yeah, too tight, not going to work. I don't think you should do it. And then you have the one friend that's like, get off my phone. And what do you think? Like, how do you approach those? Or when you think about those two situations, obviously non judgmental to both, but it's really like what's happening in both of those experiences and how has that made you think about who you're going to ask for advice from and who you're really going to lean on as like a person that you really trust and value their opinion? Well, shoot, Unique is usually the person I call now. Like, (laughs) we both do that for each other. Mm -hmm. We both actually told the story about how we've done because Unique now has a game. Uh, that she came up with called culture tags that she came up with and just mentioned it to me while she she came and visited me in December, 2019, we were sitting in my kitchen counter and she's like, I have this idea for a game. And she tells me, and I was like, you have to do this game right now. And she was like, yeah, yeah, I was thinking about whether it was good. Like, no, no, no. I need you to do this game right now. In fact, buy the URL right now, spend all this money on it, do this game. It needs to happen. Well, the game is now at Target stores worldwide a year and three months later. Wow. Target everywhere. She was featured on Target.com for Black History Month. Culture Tags has sold so many copies. So her and I both talk to each other and tell the story about how we usually loan each other courage in the moments when we have these great ideas or whatever it is. And we're usually the ones who are pouring gas on each other's fire, right? Like you got to know who's going to pour gas on it or who's going to pour water on it and like, kill the fire. And a lot of people are surrounded by people who will pour water on their dreams, who will tell them, who will like pass on their fears, not courage. Like the person who you say you want to do this thing, they're like, I don't know. And instantly you feel less brave about it because this person now has passed on their anxiety to you Mm. that didn't belong to you. And you go, yeah, you're right. Maybe I should. The person who then tells you, no, 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 no. I need you to do this thing. It's a great idea. That person infuses you with this extra courage that you're like, okay, let me just go right down this concept. I can make it happen. It is literally the difference between ideas happening and them dying. The people who we take them to. So I think people just need to be cognizant of, and you know, you know, most people know who are the friends or family that you have who will not pass on their fear to you, who will say, it's a big idea, but you can figure it out. I can help you. You can figure it out. Or the person who goes, that person, like we all know that person who just instantly like, ah, I don't know that. Yeah. And you're just like, I didn't necessarily come to you for you to kill my dream. Mm -hmm. But but you also have to know and and, and start being discerning about who those people are, because you they're not the ones that you have to share your ideas with. And this doesn't mean everybody has to ride ride your ideas, because if I Mm -hmm. gave Unique a terrible idea, she'd be like, "Mm, I don't like it, which I have before. Right. Like. I've had a conversation with her about something. And she goes, mm, no, I don't think that's it. And it's not because she was killing my dream. She's just like, here's why it's incomplete. And she'll point out where. And she'll be like, ask yourself these different questions. So the people who pour gas on your dreams are not always yes men who are just like, you can do it. Yay. It's a terrible, if it's a terrible idea, they should be able to tell you too, right? Because some ideas are just not good. Because mm-hmm. I'll sometimes will call her and be like, Ooh, you should change this thing. And she'd be like, you right. You know, so (laughs) you got to know who those people are. Who are the, who are the ones who are going to affirm you? Who are the ones who are going to tell you the truth? Actually, that's the most important. Who are the ones who are going to tell you the truth, right? Where they will ask you the questions that you haven't asked yourself. They will ask you questions that will allow you to see your blind spots. The ones who will tell you, "Mm," it's not because they're afraid. Like never will she say to me, 
I don't know. Like, if you, even if she disagrees with what I'm saying or if she doesn't love the idea, she'll go, mm, yeah, but is it a distraction or are you not focused on what you're supposed to be doing? Even in her disagreement with me, it's not that she throws anxiety onto the idea. She just finds the where the weak spot is and she'll point it out. Mm. The, there are some people who will, no matter what the idea is, even if it's an amazing idea, will instantly go, that's big. Yes. And you yes. like, you go, oh, oh you God, they just made me yes. nervous. Yes. Yeah. And you're just like, Whoa. yeah. just know who those people are. Don't take the, yeah. your ideas to them. Find the ones who are like, yeah, that's a good idea, but I think it, it can even be better. Or, yeah, no, that's a good idea. Do that right now. Execute that. Or even, that's a great idea, but I think you should wait about six months for it. And here's why. Your plate is already crazy full. You're going to burn yourself out. That's also valuable in insight that does not kill the dream. It just says, I'm watching out for you. Mm, yeah. I think part of um, being able to, to discern where you can take your ideas is also, and you talk about this in the book, knowing the fullness of who you are. I think it just becomes yeah. so much more clear. And you said that this is one of the steps to be a professional troublemaker. I just want to kind of double click on that for a second. Like, why is it important we can say like, yes, I know who I am and I know it's important, but why truly is it important in being, um, you know, as close to fearless as possible and being that troublemaker in a way that's super, um, yeah, productive and, and supportive for the world in a sense. Cause that's really what I got from this book was that like being a professional troublemaker is actually going to change the world for the better. Yeah. I think the world exists the way it is right now. Yeah. For professional troublemakers who actually spoke up and because of people who have silenced professional troublemakers. Right. I think about even the audacity to think we could travel by plane. That's some serious troublemaking. Cause at one point that didn't exist. And somebody was like, hmm, trains are slow. I think we can get places faster in the air. I think a tin can can float in the clouds and get us places faster. And somebody goes, I'm sure it's somebody who they were close to was like, that's crazy. No, that's, that's nuts. That's wild. And then somebody else must have been like, you should try it. You know, knowing ourselves, knowing our core and being clear about what we hold dear is important because as people throw whatever random opinions and things at us, we got to know what's important to us and what will make us proud at the end of it, all of it. And whether or not it's somebody else's opinion that we take on or we honor ourselves, I think the strength of character comes in handy. But troublemakers truly are the people who are disrupting for the greater good, who are like, I'm going to try to be a part of the solution to whatever the world that I want to see. And I really do think the world is good because of the people who are disrupting for good. And the world is trash because of the people who don't let them. You know, so that means we have to start honoring the disruptors. It's not, you know, like, and when, we talk, when I talk about disruptors, it's not people who bring chaos. Like, they're not troublemakers. They're just chaos bringers. But people who speak up in a room and say, hey, let's make sure that idea is more thoughtful. They're the people who are challenging your uncle at the dinner table who makes a terrible joke. You know, they're the they're their friend who tells you, hey, let's have a tough conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think all of it is necessary. And we are either the troublemakers or we've silenced troublemakers. Or we've been the people that have been neither and we just watched. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are like, oh, I wish I was a troublemaker. You can be starting today. And it's not even in big moments even. Like, that's why I'm like, even having a tough conversation is making trouble. Because if you weren't gonna do it before, if this thing is with the intention to fix something that feels broken, that still matters. The, the making trouble is not just when you're marching or challenging the system, I think it's, Sometimes you make trouble with yourself, you know, admitting that the career you have is not the one you want can actually make trouble for you because you'll be like, oh, God, now I have to fix this and like change this up because I know I hate where I work. So all of it is like, let's welcome trouble. Let's because 
at the other side of it is something better than what was there before. You know, so let's welcome the tough conversation because now you know how everybody feels and y'all can talk through it. Let's welcome the people who challenge us in, in companies because they'll make sure we do the best work possible. So instead of running away from it, I say we run towards it. Amen. Yeah, it's interesting too with like, I was thinking about when you're talking about chaos and, you know, even in like from a physics perspective of like the universe, it's like there has to be chaos to create order and chaos is like the birthing yeah. place of order. So, but it's always our perception mm. of what chaos is. It's like, is, are we perceiving this chaos to be bad or are we perceiving this to be the precursor to a creation of like a new experience or a new order? And also with, with being a troublemaker, there's so much mindfulness to it. It's so much awareness. It's like when you become to become a troublemaker, you have to be mindful of where you're being fearful or where you're being small or where you're sitting on the sidelines or where you're judging others that are living and being troublemakers themselves. And I think for me, and I'm curious of what you think, it's almost like the mindfulness and the awareness and sort of self-awareness enough of your experience and how you're living in it is the first step to becoming a troublemaker, what would you say? Absolutely. And I love that idea that, you know, order is birth in chaos. Yes. The thing is what people consider chaos is like disagreement, yeah. right? That's where chaos has been bastardized. Disagreeing in a room and having a thoughtful discussion back and forth is not chaos. People are very quick to name something as chaos, mm -hmm. but I'm like, really chaos is just something different happening and it can be beautiful but it's just because we're so uncomfortable with anything that feels like a lack of harmony when the harmony that we're even thinking about is like not even real harmony lack of disagreement does not mean harmony there's probably a lot of apathy there yes there's probably a lot of silence in there and a lot of unspoken truths. That's not harmony. Harmony is when all the truths are ex exist, right? And mm -hmm. there's no hate in the midst of it. Yes. I think that's true harmony. Lack of disagreement is not harmony. That's somebody being quiet. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's worth it because we spend so much time chasing that false harmony mm -hmm. and self betraying in the, in the process. So really, what's the good? What is the good? Yeah, I've been thinking, I've been actually obsessed with that thought lately of like true peace, the feeling of true peace and the feeling of like sur superficial peace. And it's that same concept where so many people live in homes or ha are in relationships or experiences where there's peace on the surface, but there's so much unsaid and they're not really speaking their truth. They're sweeping it under the rug. They're avoiding the conversation. They're avoiding that chaos so much that there is on the surface feeling of peace because nothing's being said. And we assume that not speaking and being quiet is peaceful, but there's so much going on underneath the surface that there's like this chaos underneath and if people are able to bring that to the surface and actually talk about it and be troublemakers, like experience chaos for a few moments, experience being unsure of what's going to be said by each person or how the how it's going to end up, people will eventually be able to experience and feel that true sense of peace and that true sense of like calm because what is what was before under the surface has now been like experienced and worked through or felt. It's an excavation, yes. you know, yes. to your point, like peace, for you to get to peace, you're going to have to have to excavate all the things that it's not okay. It's like a garden. You can't have a beautiful garden with all the weeds still there and be like, oh, just because the roses covered the weeds is beautiful. They just happen to cover the weeds. They still there. And I think that's what really happens because we've all been with the people who are just like, you know, we just have to be polite. And I'm just like, polite is a weapon polite is not okay because people will justify being quiet in a room that somebody's making a racist joke by being like oh we just have to be polite mm -hmm. and then don't welcome the rage right and because in that the other thing about that is in the constant urge for harmony there's no room for righteous rage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and that's how people end up being full adults who think their rage is never valid because they're supposed to be in the world as polite. And I'm like, my rage is just as valid as my joy. Mm -hmm. 
And if I have a reason to be angry, I should be able to express it without somebody else feeling like I'm somehow disrupting the room. I think there's so many times, we all know people who have been in rooms where you can tell where rage is not welcome. And I'm not saying, you know, Tasmanian devil rage or throwing stuff at the wall, but being somebody who feels deeply passionate about what it is that has caused them anger, however way they felt harmed. And yeah, we we don't know how to handle those situations. So then we tell people, we just gotta be polite. But why should somebody be polite in a moment when they feel harmed, right? Why should somebody be polite as a, as a, as a response to somebody's hate? Why would we ask people to somehow swallow down their anger just to make the room harmonious when if I'm already angry, the room is not harmonious. Mm -hmm. And I think all of it is just tied to the fact that like, we're afraid of real feelings. We're afraid of, we're afraid of like chaos, whatever we've, whatever we've assigned to be chaos. And I think we've given anything that, that, that assignment, we've given anything, the, the label of chaos, if it somehow rocks the boat. And I'm just like, sometimes Rocking the boat is actually what you need in the room to get what you need to get. You got to rock the boat. Forget that boat. Yeah, that tolerance of real feelings is I'm, I'm curious what you think, because like we live in such a social media world right now and media world, like what role that plays in people's tolerance of others feelings, because all it is is a difference and like. I don't know if it threatens people's identity or what it does, but what role do you think like social media and media play in that? And how have you kind of grappled with that being on social media yourself? I think, I think social media can be used to normalize what what we're saying here. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I try to use it to normalize that stuff because there's a lot of people who are like, Oh my God, we love lovey. And I'm like, but, I also will show up and show you rage about what's happening in the world that's not okay, about moments of being taken advantage of, because I wanna normalize that feeling because it's just as righteous as when I am showing joy. And where people can love it in me, I'm like, do you love it when your coworker shows a little bit of rage? Who looks like me, right? Do you honor them or do you do they get written up by HR for being difficult? You know how are we exercising our privilege and our power in these rooms? And social is a great way to exercise it to people you might never meet because I want people to normalize. I want to normalize all this stuff as somebody who has name currency, who has this big platform, who a lot of people listen to. I'm like, if you love these things in me, do not hate it in somebody else because I happen to make it more palatable for you. My form of rage might seem less threatening to you. Again, I'm not saying this is a rage of like, let's throw hands or throw something around, but people feeling deeply offended or about the state of the, the world, about being cheated in their, you know, in their offices, about being written up, the dog whistle, microaggressions. And then they're still expected to be polite at the end of it all. And I'm just like, the powerful thing about social is that we can now hear other people's stories. You know, you can hear stats all day long. It doesn't hit you until you hear a story about somebody that you know and you might have really deep respect for and you hear, oh, wow, you're still dealing with that? Wow, that makes it more real. So yeah, I think social media is a normalizing tool. It's a storytelling platform and we should tell our stories. We should talk about our lives. We should find common ground um, on these platforms and use it for that because I think the world would be better if people are less afraid of the rage of people who are marginalized. Mm. You know, everybody's rage is not going to get you harmed, mm. but people need to just listen and, and hopefully compels them to take some action that shows that they actually care about what happens to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully they peer pressure, their peer pressure into being a part of the solve of the world. That's the other thing social media is great for. You can peer pressure people to do things. So, you know, usually peer pressure is talked about and like, oh my God, somebody has been peer pressured to drink. No, no. I think we can peer pressure each other into being truer. Mm. 
for sure. More fearless. Mm -hmm. And fearless does not mean like they're not afraid. It's just like, you're not going to do less because of your fear. And some of that is going to be because we're all sharing it. And that's what I'm hoping happens. Yeah, I think there's, it's like with the peer pressure thing, sometimes I get scared that peer pressure just causes like a change in optics and not, and like, it's almost like there needs to be peer pressure and education. And, you know, I, do, I completely agree with you. I think peer pressure is really beautiful for making change in a lot of ways. But then sometimes I'm like, ah, are people just changing optically, but not actually changing internally, which is causing like great deep change that is culturally affected over time, but rather like just posting the thing or like doing the thing. I mean, you know, we I mean? saw that a hundred percent. We saw that happen with the black squares yes. of people just performing change. Yep. And that's why my last section of this book is do it's not enough to say you are going to be a part of a change. What is the action that you're taking to be a part of the change? Like I, I think the black squares of 2020 and you see the same people being microaggressive and it really gets people being like, okay, so that was a performance. It didn't have to be though. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be. People have to act on these things. Just take actual concrete action. So then it, it just doesn't end with the fact that you're saying cool things. That's why you have to be who you say you are in private and in public, mm -hmm. you know, all of it is relevant because we can't just be like, yeah, we're going to be different. We're going to grow. And then when they ask, where's the proof? And you're just like, I was going to start tomorrow, mm -hmm. like <laughs> mm -hmm. next week. Okay. Everybody has to start actually putting action to it. It's not enough to say it. It's not enough to, to perform it even. If you're performing it, I take it that it is scripted. Mm -hmm. But like, you can also perform it in real life, though. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a fake performance. Some performances are real. Mm -hmm. So you can actually perform it in real life. Don't just leave it on the social mediums or on the black square. But how are you not doing it when nobody's watching? Yeah, we were just talking about just kind of the the projection or hologram of, of what we kind of feed into as our online persona, you know, as just as a collective and yeah, how there can be that um, separation or dissonance from like what you are actually doing yes. in your everyday and how that is can be harmful both to yourself, but also just to the collective. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really fascinating. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. about, um, I think something actually that, that fits into this is, and when we're thinking about just actually doing the work or, or being the change or actually taking action on things like, you know, what we're talking about with the black square or even outside of our lives is how, I guess, do you give feedback to those you love or how do you criticize those you love or how do you have these conversations with those you love that are, that are a little bit harder, where you want to show up really honestly and you want to provide them something that's constructive and helpful? Yeah. I think, again, this goes back to the rage thing too. Mm -hmm. For me to be in community with you, I have to be able to trust you with my rage. Same for family. And like, if I can't trust you with, your, with my rage, then I kind of will back up and create distance. Mm -hmm. Because then if I can only come to you in the moments when I'm feeling good, then how do I engage with you in a real healthy way if you do something that hurts my feelings? Again, humans are not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Somebody's gonna run afoul of somebody else, even when with best intentions. For me with family, I bring them my rage if I have it. And it's not, so in all of this, what to consider is how you're behaving. Is it in that moment demeaning somebody? So as I use the word rage, it's with the thought that at no point is this about you insulting somebody. 
at no point is this about you sending slurs somebody's way, but rage in the form of, I'm really angry at you. Here's what you've done that was harmful. Here's how it made me feel. And maybe even expressing it with a louder voice than usual. With my family, if somebody has done something to hurt my feelings, I will let them know, hey, we should talk. Here's why. The other day you did or said this thing. I didn't like it because I felt disrespected as a result of it. If it's easier in writing, put it in writing and say, let's actually have a phone call about it later on. A lot of our families are not used to that. A lot of people are not used to conflict. So they think conflict of any kind is unproductive, which is not true. Conflict is really healthy. Co healthy conflict is necessary for healthy relationships. So because everybody's shying away from conflict, you don't get to tell somebody your truth, your thoughtful truth. And that's not fair. So even my Nigerian mom, I can let her know that she did something I don't like. And Nigerians are very like, oh, respect your elders, very conflict averse in certain ways. And I've even started modeling that. And my cousins have started modeling that. My siblings have too, where we have to start building the world that we want. So even the people who we're related to, if we bring stuff, we got to start doing the thing that might ruffle their feathers. So if me coming to you, sister, and saying, hey, you actually hurt my feelings the other day. I didn't like how you talked to me. I know that in that moment I'm honoring myself and I'm actually honoring her by giving her a chance to rectify this thing as opposed to building up a story in my head and being like, she meant to do that. Oh my God. And I'm going to be mad for three months and then she doesn't hear from me, <laughs> right? Nobody needs that. That's not productive. So all we can control is our side of it all. So I can't guarantee how somebody else will receive it. But again, I want to make sure my actions are honoring me and even them. And I feel like me bringing it to them is actually honoring both of us. Mm -hmm. And then however else they take it, I will know I did my part. Mm -hmm. I came to them truly, honestly, to want to resolve this thing that I'm feeling. And they didn't receive it. That is not my fault. It's not my business either what I'm learning in therapy. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. It's I was just okay. Like, therapy is amazing for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like everything you're saying, I was writing down. I'm like, you have a great unattachment to the outcome. Like that's very important where you're speaking your truth with an unattachment to the outcome. That's major. And then you don't have codependency with things where it's like, you're able to be you in your own experience and not worry about what your mom says. If you speak your truth or what all these people say, if you speak your truth. And those are definitely things that I'm learning in therapy. And I think you just do so well that are really, really important for people stepping fully into their power. And I think it could be so easy. Yeah, I think that's... It's, mm -hmm. Go ahead. It's like avoiding the people pleasing, ultimately. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And yeah. I was just thinking about, like, you know, in a family dynamic, and especially culturally where, you know, you respect your elders, and it's like breaking out of that a little bit so that there is um, growth and evolution intergenerationally mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm sure, like, you just being really honest with your mom and telling her how what she said made you feel there's also like a growth moment for her and that's an opportunity and if you would have withheld that that would have been unfortunate to not like grow in that way together and individually so I just think that's that's a really important point because I definitely have like codependent tendencies where I keep back my truth so that I don't make my parents feel insecure inferior shameful etc but it's really holding back like an opportunity for them to to grow um yeah yeah i love i love in the book uh krista and i were talking about this before we start we started the interview just writing your own life mission statement i thought that was so powerful and it actually intimidates me to think about a little bit <laughs> But I just think it's really, really powerful. Can you briefly just kind of describe what that is um, and how people can begin to design that for themselves? Yes, it's a couple of paragraphs that really talks about who you are, who you're possibly related to, what you hold dear, what your core values are, why you're still amazing, even on your worst day, and 
the legacy that you want to live. And I think it's important to write it in the moments when you're feeling good. So you can refer back to it in the moments when you're not. Um, it is an exercise that I think everybody should do that I put, I put the formula in the book for everyone to, to download, but I think it's important because there's so much to be unsure of in this world, but there's some things we can be sure of who we are, who we're related to, what makes us really good. Um, we're always, we're, play, we're placed in like a doubt loop. We're constantly doubting ourselves and each other. But I'm like, okay, what can I stand on? What is, what am I sure about? Um, and in the moments when you're really unsure or you had a horrible day or somebody called you a name that does, definitely is not yours or try to make you feel bad, you should have something to refer back to that brings you back to yourself, that reminds you that you are amazing. Um, and I think a life mission statement is exactly that. Do you go back and edit it or, or let it evolve? Or is it something that just kind of holds true? And is I think you can evolve it. I think with all things evolving it, you can look at it once a year and be like, is it still true? Yeah, like it shouldn't be a constant change because that's just too much. Mm -hmm. But like, if you change it once every couple of years, okay, that's clear, that's fair, but it's something else that is that you can hold on to, something else that's an anchor, you know? And I think it's really important to have because there's just so much that we question every single day, every single day, it's exhausting. We spend a lot of time questioning ourselves and I'm just like, what do we know to be true? Can we stick in that? Like, and think less about that stuff. So my mission statement probably won't change for the foreseeable future That's because I'm very clear what my core values are. The people who I'm related to, who I'm proud of, my mom, my grandmother, my legacy, I know I'm clear about that. What makes me amazing on my worst day, that could change. That could change, right? But most of the mission statement won't change. I could change a sentence here and there, but most of it, it can stick there. Love that. How much has your, you know, talking about your mom and your grandma and talking about your legacy, how much has your culture, like Nigerian culture, impacted you and how you show up in the world? So much. My Nigerian culture is a huge part of me from the way I write to the way I see the world to what I see as my sense of responsibility for other people. Nigerian, Nigerian culture, which is hella deep and like really variant, we're definitely not a monolith, is really collective. It's a collectivist culture where you're supposed to think about community as you're moving through it. You know, if you're okay, but your next door neighbor doesn't have food, somebody's gonna side eye you like, wow, so you didn't feed them as you were feeding your people. And I think that that part of the culture is definitely something that I hold dear because I'm deeply, I feel deeply responsible for what happens in the world. I feel deeply responsible for what happens to the people around me. And I feel like if I'm good, but everybody I love is not, that I'm not good. And that, that I think is really deeply in the Nigerianness of it all. Um, and how I write, you know, Yoruba, which is my language, my first language, actually Yoruba and English are equally my first language, but it's my lineage language. It's very metaphorical. It's very descriptive. Like there are certain words, there's a lot of words that don't have English equivalents. And even that affects how I write because I think in pictures, kind of how the language does too. Um, and that's a big part of why a lot of people love my writing because they're like, yo, this is hilarious. And I'm like, I said that with a straight face, but okay. <laughs> like, I'm like, I, I actually wrote it with a straight face, but hey, if it made you laugh, I'm with it. And that's really why my writing, I literally be like, man, I was so serious. And everybody's like, yo, that was hilarious. I'm like, really? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so it works it really works and the humor is cultural yeah there's a lot to that that's cultural that's beautiful uh last question for me um you talk in the book about 
just being quote unquote too much. And Mm -hmm. I feel like I've had so many conversations with women in our community specifically where they, and in the context mainly of uh, dating and being in their single season and just feeling like that was reflected back to them so often that they were too much, too confident, yeah. too, they shine too much, too this, too that. Um, and I experienced that as well. And yeah, I just, I love this idea that it actually is like your superpower. So what was your experience in kind of realizing that that part of you that the world thought was too much was actually the thing that was going to set you apart in the best way? Yeah, I think the too much thing, women especially, especially get that, like, you're too much, or you're too sensitive, or if you're a Black woman, you're getting, you're you're too aggressive. And I think for me, that experience, I mean, what I got usually was, you talk too much. And I'm like, yo, that's what makes me amazing. I'm I'm a great speaker because I talk too much. You know, I make good money because I talk too much. It really is one of those moments when you start realizing that a lot of us and the feedback that we've received, whether growing up or even now, have been told that we're too something because people won't say, I want you to be less. It's easier to say you are too. And that thing that you've been critiqued about oftentimes is your gift you know, or is something that makes you stand out for good if it's wielded well. But because we've been crit- like criticized about it, we've internalized it as something that we need to change or be ashamed of or be guilty about. Somebody has probably been called too big, right? So now they're like, shoot, I need to lose weight. I've been called too small. I have actually been called too small. And I'm like, so you want me to gain weight? Okay, but then you tell the other person to lose weight. So at what point do you meet us in the middle? Like, at what point will we be good? Like, what happens if we don't spend so much time internalizing these critiques and thinking there are things we need to change? What happens if we say, oh, you think I'm too tall? Well, shit, maybe I'll be good at basketball. You know, you think I'm too thoughtful or too quiet? Maybe I'll be a great therapist, okay? You think I talk too much? I'd be an amazing speaker. But so many of us have been traumatized out of our superpower or insulted out of our superpower that then we grow up and we go like, I'm looking for my purpose. Yeah, your purpose was tied to that thing that people critiqued out of you and now you have to reclaim it and that's tough. So I want us to have permission to be too much, whatever that too is. And again, where the nuance comes in in that if this is something that is not harming you or somebody else, then why are you two of it? Right. Like, yeah, if they say you're too aggressive because you punch everybody, sure, chill. But if they say you're too aggressive because you get real passionate about your work and your voice goes up and you use your hands like I do. Who did that harm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, powerful. Love that. I'm so thankful you got to come on. You're just on fire right now. And I'm Mm -hmm. just really excited for you. Like number three and just I know how hard you work and I know you know that this stuff doesn't come with a lot of self-work and a lot of internal work and I know that you've just done it all so my last question is how are you celebrating you know good question I have not started to celebrate yet I figured I will celebrate in about a month I am gonna run away for like two weeks good for you I'm gonna find some water and a beach and some heat, and I'm gonna do nothing. Yeah, That's how you. I'm gonna celebrate. I'm gonna do nothing. I'm gonna be useless to everybody and myself. I'm just gonna be like taking naps, yeah. reading if I feel like it, writing if I feel like it, binge watching all the things. <laughs> yeah, eating cake, ice cream. Yes. Yeah. That's how I'm gonna celebrate. Now I'm gonna buy myself something nice too. I gotta figure Ooh. out what it is. I'm such a geek. I'm over here like, oh, do I buy myself a new MacBook? I'm <laughs> <laughs> Like I'm something for work. You're like, oh, no. something. Yeah, literally. A new no. journal. I'm like, do I buy myself a new MacBook? Because that's exciting to you me. Should. I should. But it was funny is I actually buy myself a new MacBook every two to three years. Because, but I'm just like, I should do something like, 
I should buy myself something just frivolous. You should buy something that it's not yes. for work. Yeah. Right? Like something ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe some. I, hmm. It just feels different was, when you do it for yourself. It's such yeah. a different feeling. Yeah. Which is, I, yeah. It's empowering, but yeah. it's also like. Maybe oh, buy your, I mean, your jacket's so dope. Your style's so cool. Maybe buy yourself like a fucking splurge piece. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, is there a pair of shoes yes. that's just dumb? But yes. I'm just like, ooh, I want these because I just want them. Yes. I got found. I gotta find out. Yes. So I because I'm like, I gotta number three is epic. So I gotta do oh, something that's just you need dumb. Some crazy epic. shoes. Yes, I cannot wait. It's Custom some something. shoes. Yes. Some diamonds. I, I might buy myself some jewelry. diamonds. I completely I totally I'm I'm here I really do love jewelry because I'm always wearing like yes. three chains. And so I'm like, ooh, maybe my jeweler can like make me something really nice with rubies. I gotta I figure it out because I got I, I gotta do it. I got because I have to do it. I'm just like, oh no, I gotta commemorate this moment yes. with something. So I gotta think about that. So I'm gonna do a luxurious vacation for sure, and then some other item. Yes, dope shoes and beautiful. Story. We'll be I'm, looking out for it. Yeah, I'm glad we ended on that actually. So you could like now leave and be like, what am I gonna do with my <laughs> shoes and my jewelry? Like now it's like you can go daydream. Um, and so every yes. book is available on Amazon. We'll have it in our show notes. Um, and then we have another interview with you that we did previously, mm -hmm. which was incredible. So just thanks again for coming on and yeah, just sending you, you like so much love. And thanks, Tiff, for your for your help. Tiffany, for your help. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me back. Yes. You're so welcome. Awesome. You're so welcome. Proud of you. And we'll we'll definitely talk to you soon. Hopefully we get to meet in person at yes. some point. In yes, podcast. indeed. After this crazy pandemic. I feel I that. Awesome. All right, lovey. Have a wonderful day. Appreciate you. Bye. Bye, guys. And we'll see you soon. Bye.